Hi guys, welcome to video number 17. Today's topic is voltage divider biasing. If you saw the previous video where we talked about beta independence, this biasing arrangement is a really big step in that direction. Uh, the circuit we're going to examine is here on the left where we've got a voltage divider consisting of R1 and R2 biasing up the transistor. Now, in order to analyze this circuit, we're going to apply Thevenin's theorem and we're going to determine the Thevenin equivalent of the base network. To do that, we remove the load, which is the transistor, and we find VTH and RTH looking back into this uh, center terminal of the divider. All right, if you want a review of the voltage divider equation derivation, that's video number eight, and Thevenin's theorem is video number six. But anyway, applying those uh, techniques, we end up with this equivalent circuit for the voltage divider. VTH is VCC times R2 over R1 plus R2, and RTH is R1 in parallel with R2. All right, now substituting this Thevenin equivalent back into our original circuit, this is what we get. And for reference purposes, I put the original circuit over here on the left. All right, now for a well-designed circuit, that is a circuit with a relatively stable Q point independent of beta, we require beta times RE to be much larger than RTH. Beta times RE, much bigger than this. And another requirement that's pretty easy to meet is we want the Thevenin voltage to be greater than or equal to two VBE values. Okay, that gives us uh, good temperature stability because VBE does change somewhat with temperature. And if we make VTH twice that value, it swamps out those changes pretty well. All right, in the middle of the schematics, I put all the pertinent analysis equations that we've derived previously. Uh, a bunch of them are already totally beta independent. That is uh, VTH, RTH. IC sat and VCE cutoff, these are not affected by beta at all. The ones that are affected are ICQ and VCEQ. All right, let's go down and apply this information to a practical example. All right, here we've got a circuit. I've filled in all of the resistor values and let's start by finding the values for the Thevenin equivalent. Uh, VTH, is equal to VCC times R2 over R1 plus R2. So that's 15 volts times 2.7K over 12K plus 2.7K. And I'm leaving the units out. Uh, technically, uh, I shouldn't do that, but they cancel anyway because they're in ohms up here and ohms down here. So anyway, crunching through these numbers, we end up with a VTH of uh, 2 point, let's see, what is it? 2.76 volts. And our RTH value is R1 in parallel with R2. So that's 12K in parallel with 2.7k, which are, works out to be about 2.2k ohms. All right, so here are Thevenin values, 2.76 volts. I'll write that here. And RTH is 2.2k ohms. All right, let's go ahead over and calculate the cutoff and saturation current. That's easy enough. VCE cutoff is simply 15 volts. IC saturation is 15 divided by RC plus RE. So 15 divided by 3700 gives us oh, 4.05 milliamps. All right, so we've got 4.05 milliamps here and 15 volts here. All right, these values won't change no matter what beta does, so we don't need to worry about those anymore. 
All right, let's clear our workspace here and let's determine ICQ for beta equals 100. Okay, a pretty reasonable estimate for beta. All right, ICQ equals VTH minus VBE divided by RTH over beta plus RE. All right, so we've got 2.76 volts minus 0.7 volts. All right, RTH is 2200 divided by 100 is just 22 plus 1000 is 1022 ohms and that gives us an ICQ of about 2.01 milliamps. Now I'm being very precise here because we're going to do a comparison of this ICQ with the ICQ uh, with different betas so just bear with me here. All right so ICQ is 2.01 milliamps and VCEQ is VCC minus ICQ times RC plus RE. All right, so we've got 15 volts minus 2.01 milliamps times uh, 2,700 plus 1,000 is 3,700 ohms. And crunching through these numbers, we get 7 point five six volts all right so there's our q point two milliamps roughly on this scale we just put it right in the middle 2.01 milliamps and of course this voltage is practically in the middle too 7.56 volts so we've got a relatively centered q point Again, that's probably a good place to be. All right, now, if we are desiring to keep the Q point right here about in the middle, what happens if we use transistors that have extreme betas, say 50 or 300? Is it going to screw up our Q point location? Well, let's take a look and see. All right, clearing out our workspace. With a beta of 50, we end up with an ICQ of, uh, da, 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 where it's that to be, again, 2.06 volts, divided by, this time, 1,044 ohms. So if beta is 50, our ICQ drops down to 1.97 milliamps. All right. Now, on this graph, you wouldn't really see any difference in the vertical displacement of this current, but it has decreased a little bit. Now, if beta equals 300, we end up with ICQ equals 2.06 volts divided by uh, 1,007, which gives us 2.04 milliamps. All right, so we estimated beta of 100 and it gave us 2.01 milliamps for ICQ. If the beta was low, it would be 1.97. If the beta was high, it would be 2.04. There's virtually no difference in the ICQ value over this extreme range of beta from 50 to 300. And that's a good thing. And remember, that's because beta times RE was very big compared to RTH. All right, if we assume beta is 100, 100 times RE is 100 K ohms, and RTH was 2.2 K ohms, and that does meet this inequality. In fact, it's a 45 to 1 ratio. So we've met this inequality by a factor of 45. That's pretty good. Our change in collector current for a beta from 50 to 300 is only plus 3.6% from here to here. 
we've only had a 3.6% increase in collector current. That's pretty beta independent. All right, and that's what we were after. All right, so uh, let's do another example just to solidify these concepts. Whoops, and that's, let's try and get this lined up. There we go, that looks nice. All right, so it's a lower power supply voltage. This time we're sitting with a nine volt power supply and we've got 20K and 4.7K for our voltage divider. So let's find our Thevenin equivalent values VTH equals VCC times R2 over R1 plus R2. So now it's 9 volts times 4.7K divided by 20K plus 4.7K. And that gives us a VTH of about 1.71 volts. All right, we'll record that up here, 1.71 volts. Our Thevenin resistance is R1 in parallel with R2. So we've got 20K in parallel with 4.7K, which gives us an RTH of about uh, 3.8K. All right, 3.8K ohms. Let's write that up here. All right, and again, we'll find our cutoff and saturation values. VCE cutoff is simply VCC, which is 9 volts. IC sat is 9 divided by 3,300 plus 1,000. So 9 divided by 4,300 gives us 2.09 milliamps. All right, so we've got 9 volts, 2.09 milliamps and again in real life I'd probably just round that to 2.1 let it go but anyway there are our load line limits okay let's clear the board here and determine ICQ and VCEQ All right assuming beta equals 100 ICQ equals uh, VTH minus VBE, which is uh, one volt, well, actually 1.01 volts, divided by RTH over beta, 3,800 divided by 100 is 38 plus 1,000, so that's 1,038 ohms, which gives us an ICQ of, uh, 973 microamps. All right, so our Q point is sitting at a collector current of 973 microamps. VCEQ is VCC minus 973 microamps times uh, 4300 ohms, right, RC plus RE, and that works out to be about 4.82 volts. So our Q point is 4.82. That's pretty close to the center, right? Four and a half would be the exact center. So we're at 4.82 volts. And 973 microamps for ICQ. Okay, again, a fairly well-centered Q point. All right, at the beta extremes, uh, are we going to see much change? Well, let's see what our uh, beta times RE is compared to RTH. Does this inequality hold true? Well, beta times RE is 100 times 100,000 or I'm sorry, times 1,000, which is 100 K ohms. And that is much larger than 3.8 K. All right. And in fact, it's a ratio of 26 to 1. Not quite as good as the previous circuit. So uh, we're going to get a little bit more variation in beta or Q point with beta this time, but not a whole lot. 
and I'm going to leave it for you guys to, to determine that in this case, we're going to get about a 6% change in ICQ when beta varies from 50 to 100. We're going to get a plus, uh, what was it, about, yeah, about a 6% change in ICQ. All right, that's relatively beta independent, not quite as good as the previous circuit because we have 26 to 1 here, and in the previous circuit, we had a 45 to 1 ratio, which made it a little better. All right, now I'm going to leave with a homework assignment for you guys to do. All right, here's our circuit. Um, I want you to determine. VTH, RTH, ICQ, VCEQ, and cutoff and saturation. Plot the Q point and the DC load line coordinates. And uh, answer the question, can this circuit be considered beta independent for a transistor with a beta that ranges from 50 to 300? Uh, I think you can probably guess that, it, yes, it's going to be beta independent. But I'll leave the details up to you, and uh, if anybody's interested, I'll show the results in a future video. But that concludes today's video. We're going to look at another uh, relatively beta-independent biasing arrangement in the next video, so hopefully everyone will stick around to watch that one too. And I'll catch you next time.